Good afternoon. I would like to welcome colleagues and guests to the UCSF Spring Division Meeting on Gender Equity. Since its inception, UCSF has practiced its pride values with considerable success. Today, we will focus on E, excellence in equity. Organizations can often benefit substantially from generous leaders in other fields who share their wisdom. Today, we have the privilege of two exceptional leaders who will give us their thoughts and their experiences on how UCSF may further its excellence in gender equity. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, our chancellor, uh, Sam Hargood. Chancellor Hargood has been a longstanding faculty member at UCSF, and since 2014, he's been serving in the leadership role as chancellor. Welcome, Chancellor. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Stephen, and uh, welcome and hello to everyone who is uh, online listening to this uh, very important uh, panel on gender equity. My, my role here this afternoon is to introduce our speakers, and it gives me enormous pleasure to begin by introducing uh, Sherry Lansing, who is on Zoom, or was on Zoom a second ago, but I'm sure she will be back. Um, uh, Sherry Lansing is a UC Regent Emeritus. I'm here. I'm here. Hey, Sherry. <laughs> I just I wanted to get some water. I love being introduced by you. I wouldn't miss this for anything. <laughs> That's great. Well, welcome back and welcome, welcome uh, virtually to UCSF. I know you, you know us well. So uh, I was just beginning. Uh, Sherry Lansing is a UC Regent Emeritus and the, and the CEO of the Sherry Lansing Foundation. And uh, I will say, and Sherry may correct me, but she is also... Uh, become a good friend of mine over the last uh, 20 years and is a role model uh, for me to what excellence in being a board member in a region looks like. Uh, during almost 30 years in the motion picture business, Sherry was involved in the production, marketing, and distribution of more than 200 films, including Academy Award winners Forrest Gump, Braveheart, and Titanic. In 1992, she became the first woman to head a major studio, 20th Century Fox, taking the leadership role again when she later served as the chairman and CEO of Paramount Pictures. She continued to lead Paramount for an unprecedented tenure that lasted more than 12 years. Sherry's strong belief in the power of education to create lasting social change, coupled with her time as a math and English teacher prompted her to create the Sherry Lansing Foundation, an organization dedicated to public education and encore career opportunities, as well as health and cancer research. Sherry was appointed in March of 1999 by Governor Davis, and then reappointed to the Regents by Governor Schwarzenegger in 2020, 2010. So you can do the math, she was a Regent for 24 years, and the University of California is by far better uh, from that service. She is an esteemed and very recently named Emerita UC Regent. As a Regent, she chaired many committees, spearheaded a number of UC initiatives, and served as the board chair of the Regents from July 2011 to June 2013. Uh, I know Sherry predominantly as her uh, role as the inaugural chair of the Health Services Committee, an incredibly important committee from UCSF's perspective on the regions. And she was truly a remarkable chair and a friend to all of the campuses. So Sherry, a very warm welcome to UCSF. Well, I just wanna, I know you're gonna introduce everyone else, but I just wanna say that your friendship is truly one of the great blessings in my life. And thank you for all the kind words, but I would say all the kind words back at you. You have been a role model and an inspiration to me. And I'm just so grateful to know you. And I know our friendship goes on forever. So thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce another great friend to UCSF. And that is Mary Krogan, who has been 
UC Davis as provost and executive vice chancellor since July of 2020. Mary, thanks so much for driving down uh, to San Francisco today. I know it can be uh, a grueling drive. Provost Krogan came to UC Davis with many years of distinguished service as both an administrator and faculty member, chiefly at the University of California. After earning her Bachelor of Science degree in community health at UC Davis and her PhD in epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Hygiene and Public Health, Provost Krogan spent 30 years as a professor with us here at UCSF in our School of Medicine and in the Departments of Family and Community Medicine, Obstetrics, Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences and Epidemiology and Biostatistics. Mary served as co-director of the required epidemiology and biostatistics medical school course for 15 years. I guess we call that now advanced data science or something, uh, even, even artificial intelligence uh, and such things. Uh, Mary was awarded the Academic Senate's Distinguished Teaching Award, as well as serving as a founding member of our Academy of Medical Educators. So most importantly for today's seminar topic, Mary worked on gender equity with regard to both compensation and promotion, parental leave, policies, academic personnel issues, and she co-led the task force that developed the UCSF faculty mentoring program. These are all uh, legacy contributions to UCSF. Mary served as chair of the system-wide academic senate in 2008 and 2009, and as executive director of the research grants program office at the UC office of the president. Most recently, she served as Vice President for Research and Economic Development at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and now as Chief Academic Officer of UC Davis, including UC Davis Health in Sacramento, Provost Krogan oversees all aspects of the university's mission of teaching, research, and public service. Her top priorities include student success, maintaining and advancing educational excellence, augmenting the university's capacity to perform critical transdisciplinary research and furthering its culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, given that Mary grew up here at UCSF, uh, we're very happy to have you back with us this afternoon. And now I'd like to uh, introduce our two Senate uh, committee co-chairs um, somewhat more briefly, if you uh, forgive me. Um, firstly, Andrea Sarotin. Andrea is a geriatric psychiatrist and a professor of clinical psychiatry, uh, uh, both clinical and research. Her research interests include psychiatric aspects of neurodegenerative diseases, particularly movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease. She also has been doing gender equity work since 2004. In 2008, Andrea received the UC Davis Chancellor's Achievement Award for diversity and community for this work. Uh, we uh, welcomed her to UCSF in 2015, and she continues this important work in her Senate role. And finally, Dr. Lindsay Ham Hampson is a practicing urologist an assistant professor in the Department of Urology, focusing on genitourinary reconstruction. Lindsay's research interests include improving decision-making for older individuals, facing quality of life surgery, and improving access and quality of care for patients with complex uh, urologic conditions. A mother of, two and of, of a two-year-old and a five-year-old, Lindsay is passionate about improving support for faculty with dependents and supporting women in medicine. She was nominated to the UCSF Muriel Steele Society Honor Roll for influential and inspiring women in, for, for influencing and inspiring women in surgery for the past two years and as a faculty mentor in the Women Empowering Women Urologist Network at UCSF. Lindsay received the American Urologic Association Young Urologist of the Year Award for commitment to advancing the development of early career urologists. And she serves as a faculty mentor for the national underrepresented trainees entering residency programs. So welcome to both Andrea and Lindsay, and I now turn it over to Andrea 
who will give an overview of today's panel. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chancellor Hogwood, for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here, truly an honor, and I'm inspired by my co-facilitator, Lindsay. Um, we would like first to thank all the groups that have been working for improving gender equity here, including the Office of Diversity and Outreach, led by, led by Dr. Rene Navarro, Office of Faculty and Academic Affairs, led by Dr. Brian Aldridge, and the Faculty Mentoring Program with Dr. Mitch Feldman. And uh, it was lovely to hear that Dr. Krogan was also involved. We are also very grateful to our Regent Lansing and Provost Krogan for being here today. We want to acknowledge that a lot of progress has been made with regards to gender equity in academia and at UCSF in particular over the last two decades. However, the past two years of the COVID pandemic have affected disproportionately women and underrepresented minority faculty. And it is our hope that today we will develop together, we'll have a conversation about this, and we will develop some action items that will help us regain this momentum. We, are also, we also want to acknowledge that the data we looked at specifically talk about gender equity as in, in the form of gender women and men differences. However, uh, we want to acknowledge that our colleagues who are non-binary and transgender also have a voice and a very important perspective. So we are calling on all of us who are listening today and are here with us to help us develop better data collection and hopefully the voices and perspectives will also be more visible or more audible soon. Also, in preparing for this event, we reviewed multiple data sources. Some of the data, particularly quantitative data, talk about, look at gender differences and find no gender differences, no gender differences with regards, for example, to base salary. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit as well as time to promotion, for example, between from assistant to associate. We want to acknowledge that the quantitative data don't always tell us the entire story. The story may also be in the qualitative data, in the survey responses, such as the Net Promoter Survey, and so we are looking for better ways to collect data, quantify that is not currently quantifiable, is quantifiable but not quantified, and also looking for better qualitative data, data measurement. Uh, with that, um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to all those who contributed data. And I am hoping we can advance to the, the acknowledgement slide, or can I, do I have the power to do that? I have the power. Okay, these are all the groups and people, individual people who have helped us. We reviewed all these data sources. Thank you to everyone who is here representing and has helped us put together our questions for our wonderful two panelists. And with this, I'm going to let uh, Lindsay tell you a little bit about uh, the agenda for today. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Andrea, and welcome to everyone who's here in person and virtually. Um, just to give you a brief idea of what's going to happen today, um, Andrea and I have worked with um, lots of people to develop questions, which we hope will inspire some good discussion and conversation about gender equity. And we'll try to limit our questions to about five to seven minutes each so that we can get through a fair amount, uh, giving both of our panel participants time to answer. Um, we are saving some time at the end for audience questions because we really do want to hear from everyone. We think part of the importance of having a meeting focused on gender equity is hearing people's voices. And so we've tried to do that in collecting our own information, but we want to hear the voices of people who are attending as well. So to that end, let's see if this works. It's our QR code. Let's see if I can do it this way. 
Okay, we have a poll everywhere set up. Um, this is a chance for you to put questions that you want to be addressed. Um, you can write in your own questions or you can upvote questions that are already there. So you can either just go to the website or you can scan this QR code, either should work. And when you put a question in, you can put it in anonymously if you choose. And then anyone who's on the poll everywhere site can decide if they are interested in promoting your question and hearing the answer to that question, they can upvote it. And as we are talking, um, Christy, our amazing Senate analyst, will be monitoring the poll everywhere, and we'll use that as a guide to um, kind of field our audience questions afterwards. Um, so with that, I'm excited to welcome Provost Krogan to the, to the table and Regent Lansing, welcome. We see you well. So even though you may not be able to see us so well, uh, you're coming through loud and clear. Good. Thank you. Okay. okay, hopefully you. you guys can hear. Okay, perfect. So we're gonna start out our first question um, thinking about a concept that Provost Krogan is well aware of, which is the concept of achievement relative to opportunity. And this is something that really um, came to the forefront during the COVID crisis. Obviously caregivers, in particular women caregivers, not only at UCSF, but nationally were really put in the center stage as understanding the kind of effects of caregiving while trying to maintain their professional lives. Um, and so the concept of achievement relative to opportunity has been advanced as a way to say, can we do a better job of quantifying the ways that people are contributing and their successes and their achievements with respect to the challenges, barriers, and opportunities that they've faced as a result. Provost Krogan was actually a leader at UC Davis in instituting this concept of achievement relative to opportunity. And our own UCSF leadership, um, in concert with the Committee on Advancement and Promotion, I see Steve Hetz here, was also really instrumental in very quickly adopting this at UCSF. Um, so the question is, and I'll start with you first, Provost Krogan. Given that we know that these impacts that caregivers face are not just limited to COVID, how do we think about the concept of achievement relative to opportunity? Should this be something that we expand more broadly? And should it be something that we adhere to beyond the effects of COVID? Thank you. I, I think it's a great question. I want to begin with um, this report, Mitigating COVID-19 Impacts on Faculty Working Group. This is our final, final report, uh, and I co-chair it with Robert Horwitz, the Academic Senate Chair for the system. So by now, this has been transmitted to Provost Brown. He literally received it today. And this is where the achievement relative to opportunities really was put forward as something for every department, uh, both for the faculty member level, the departmental committee and department chairs, the deans, CAP, the vice provost, academic affairs, and the provost to consider when looking at files, both for merits and for advancement. And I bring it up in this context because we thought this was so critical that we put it in effect for the next five years. We don't see that COVID is going to uh, stop having effects on faculty in a year or two, even as we go down the, the epidemic or pandemic curve but rather those effects will be long felt. So you will see when this gets distributed back out to the campuses across the system, you will see that there is also a strong recommendation would be the way I would phrase it, that ARO principles as we call them now, uh, be considered indefinitely in the University of California. Now, especially as an ex Senate chair, I can tell you those kinds of things do better when they are highly encouraged or strongly recommended and quite honestly, not put into the academic personnel manual. It's a two to three year process to make a change in the APM system wide. 
So doing them as a recommendation, quite honestly, I can tell you who as someone who's written APM policy, I don't initially start off telling anybody to start there. Um, that's how we got parental leave. That's how we then got paternal leave because it started with just women, got adoption leave instead of just birth. It's a very iterative process when you want to change the APM. So if over the course of this next five years, this can really be institutionalized at the campuses through COVID, honestly, then I think it has a chance to really survive long-term and, and become embedded in the culture and approval process. Having said that, um, there has been pushback by some campuses. Uh, there are campuses that feel like we are lowering the standards, that we're lowering the quality. Um, I, since this may be recorded, I'm not gonna name who the two are, but they're large campuses in the UC system. Dan knows who they are too. Uh, because this becomes a discussion among uh, the, the executive vice chancellors across the, the system. And so it really has to be something that honestly bubbles up from the faculty as a request made of their committees on academic personnel and also through their committees on faculty welfare. So I would say for both of you, you're in a good position to help, although UCSF is not one of the campuses where it's been an issue, as you know. Um, but it's when you think of it, achievement relative to opportunities, because it's not immediately obvious to everybody what it actually means. But think here, if you had greater clinical opportunity, or you could think of it greater clinical responsibilities or expectations because of the pandemic, needless to say, the work that you're doing on research is likely to decline. We believe that that work that's been the increased service and patient care load should be rewarded. It was necessary service. You were an essential worker. We needed more patients taken care of. You may have also been in a different role that took some of the workload off your clinical partners and enabled them to do that patient care and you should be rewarded for that. If you had to convert all your teaching to remote or dual modality, uh, technologies, that then you should be compensated, so to speak, for the additional time it took to modify all your teaching materials. So when you think of the ARO principles, really think about what were the opportunities you were presented with? Was research shut down, field work, ability to interact with patients on a research level shut down? So what did you turn to instead? and you should be promoted for achievements, outstanding achievements in those areas. That's why I think that concept can continue in the University of California to be a strength. And it's not just about dependent care, whether it's children or elder care, it's about all the things, because unfortunately bad things happen to everybody, whether it's illness, whether it's another pandemic, whether it's you didn't get funding for three years there are things that happen and what did people achieve given the circumstances that they faced. So I do hope it, it does become a cultural shift. Yeah, and I think, you know, we, I think are lucky at UCSF to have had leadership that was very supportive and very early adopters of this concept because there was a groundswell, as you say, mm -hmm. um, you know, coming from multiple Senate committees of people worried about, you know, not that we should hold people back, but that we should continue to advance them because they're doing amazing things in spite of these challenges. And I wanna to touch on one thing you mentioned, which was that you know all of this, the principle of ARO is still in maintaining an excellent standard at our university system. And so Regent Lansing, I might turn to you mm -hmm. um, and just ask, you know, knowing that we, think this concept is important, but while maintaining a very high standard that's made us a world-class university, what do you see as a long-term you know, member of the Board of Regents that, that are the challenges of implementing something like this at the UC level? Thank you. Um, first of all, um, the UC, I just want to emphasize, is joint governance. So all matters re relating to faculty and to the scholastic uh, coursework, everything that's academic is in your hands, not in the regents. 
So you have the power to do this. Um, it's nice when you ask for feedback from the regions. It's nice when you get try and get our support. But I hate to say this, um, but it's not necessary. So if you decide to do this, and I'm not opposed to it, but let's say I was opposed to it, you could hear me out, but you could still do it. So I really want to make that clear because I think there's such a misconception or misunderstanding about how the university is governed. And during my ter terms as a region, I would often have faculty come to get my support. And I would sometimes say yes or no, but it didn't make any difference. And that's what I was really trying to tell them. You want to change this course, you want to do this with the faculty, you can do it. So this is completely in your hands. But I think as you were stating, um, especially as the provost was stating, what you want is to get consensus from the faculty and that's what you need. Now, how I personally feel about it is, um, is, is, is clear and, and, and with, with some caveats. Um, the university, um, and, and it was with the faculty and the regents, um, adopted several years ago, a holistic approach to admissions. And what does that mean in a very simple way? It means you're more than just your, well, we're not doing it anymore, but your test scores, your SAT or, or ACT scores, and you're more than just your grades. It's what the challenges that you had to face. So, you know, if God forbid, you know, your mother died in your junior year and you had all A's all the other times and then your grades were bad in your junior year, obviously because you were suffering from this tragedy, we tried to take that into account when we were determining whether or not you should be admitted. And when I say we, I mean the university. Or if you were very bad in math and you're the greatest violin player in the world and we thought, wow, you know, maybe math isn't that person's skill, but look what they do with the violin. Maybe that's why we choose. So we have always approached admissions and, and it's on each campus in a holistic way. But the only caveat is, is that there was a baseline. And I think that is extremely important. Um, there are tragedies and there are, you know, situations that can hold someone back. But if you don't have a baseline of the highest academic achievement in your faculty and the highest level of accomplishment, as well as in, in the students that you're looking at, then I, I don't agree in promotion or admission. So it starts with a certain baseline that you know, any, any faculty should have and anyone admitted to the university should have. And from that baseline, I do think we should take a holistic approach and take into account what might have held somebody back um, and what might have not given them the opportunity. But it must have a baseline, in my opinion. Having said that, you have the right to do whatever you want. But I hope you will start from a very high baseline. Yeah. Could I make of one course, one comment? Because uh, one thing Sherry said there uh, that's very uh, pertinent is holistic review for admissions. And we named this not just achievement relative to opportunities, but holistic review for academic advancement. So the exact same concept she just described. And I think that's great because both of them then must have a very high baseline to be promoted or to be admitted. I'd like to turn next um, to a discussion on recruitment. And um, we have seen data show that women in medicine and science get significantly fewer financial resources than men do. And this has been a pervasive problem. Um, one example is that women get on average smaller startup packages when they're starting up labs or um, coming on to faculty. And one question that we'd like to ask is how we at UCSF can be leaders in promoting equity um, in recruitment. And we can use the example of startup packages, but it's really broader than that. And Regent Lansing, I'll turn it to you first. I'm interested in, you know, with your experience with Hollywood's response to the gender pay gap, are there lessons to be learned from us from that experience that we can take here to make us really leaders in this area? Yes. Um, first of all, 
I'm horrified that there is not equity in pay gap in, in this area, that the startup packages aren't equal. And I, I actually need to dig in deeper and ask you why, because it's almost illegal. Do you know? I mean, if, I mean it, it is, I think, illegal you know, not to pay two people who are doing the same job or have the same lab, so to speak, not the same money. So this is really something that is horrifying to me. Um, I saw a film, uh, with, it, it was not about uh, any of the UCs, but it was a, a bunch of women who did a documentary on how poorly they were treated. Um, and it wasn't just pay, it was uh, sexual harassment, whatever. And it was staggering to me that in this, and this was recent, it was, you know, they went back to the past, but this was recent. There is, I mean, this, the regions would never tolerate. I mean, I just have to say that. There is a unanimous agreement among all the regions, uh, equal pay for equal work, um, you know, equal startup packages for equal work. I mean, th th there just should be no discrimination against women or, you know, any, any, uh, any minority group. It, it should all be equal. So I, I can't believe that it's still happening at our UC. Now, um, what did we do in Hollywood, which is, is not known for equality in, at all, um, is there were activists. And there were activists who let, let their vo voices be heard. And they formed, you know, Time's Up. And, and a woman named Gina Davis did something on gender equality um, in the film business. And I think you should reach out to her um, she's highly, highly intelligent, and she she's largely responsible. Her organization that got data, real data. Sorry, someone is. <laughs> well, <laughs> while you're while you're answering that, I will say I think one thing that Andrea mentioned in our introductions was in making sure that we're actually collecting the data that's necessary mm -hmm. and. I think Regent Lansing, you're speaking to that as well, that it's important that we actually collect these data so that we can find if and identify inequities. And if they exist, then we can do something mm -hmm. about them because without having data, we can't address it. We can't know if there's a problem or an inequity or how to fix it. Did we get her back? We lost what, sound. Regent Lansing, we don't have your sound anymore. All right, wait. So there okay, sorry, I don't know what happened, but I think I think somebody called in the middle. This is like not a perfect thing, is it? Um, but anyways, what I started to say is Gina Davis is that's where I left off. Was it's extremely bright, and she got data, and she got data to show the inequality in pay and the inequality in you know uh, job descriptions and 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 the inequality in roles portrayed. So my advice, I mean, this is, in, this is something that no one can object to. My advice to all is to start to get the data, to start to have activist groups of women who are, you know, have, have suffered these abuses to make it known. Um, uh, now in the film business, there's quotas that you have to hire 50% women. And they all, many companies have de determined to do that by, by five years from now, people of color, there's data uh, on as well. And there's a push again to, to, to make our, 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 our hiring more fair. So all I can say is there's not a region who would object to equal pay for equal work. There's not a region who would tolerate, we you know the UC bylaws, sexual harassment or any kind of inequality, not just for women, but for any minority group. And I think you can learn from Hollywood by having activists speak up, speak out, do documentaries if you can. I mean, they're not very hard to do. Get, get a campaign going and go to people like Gina Davis and ask for advice and they'll give it to you and start to have groups because I, I just can't even believe this is still happening. That's all I can say. Provost Crone, I'll give you a little short chance to respond and just ask if you have any thoughts about, you know, the collection of data, how we make that happen. Yeah, so this, this was actually not the first report on gender equity uh, with regard to 
salary and promotion, but this was the second. So this was December 18th, 1991. And this was me, Nola Hilton, Molly Cook, Kathy Giacomini, mm -hmm. for any of the old timers, you know, all those people. Uh, these were the four activists on this campus. And what we did different from the previous study that was done in the mid 80s, this one being in 1991, was develop a new methodology. And in addition to the new methodology, uh, Joe Martin was chancellor at the time. You might have been chair of pediatrics at the time, Sam, or it might have even predated you. Uh, but Joe, we went to Joe Martin first and said, we're not even going to collect this data or analyze it unless you promise us you will act on it. That was a critical, critical component. So when we finished with the analyses, we presented it to the entire campus at a leadership retreat. And every department chair was had been told in advance by the chancellor they were responsible for making every equity adjustment in between men and women in their departments. Any person, male or female, making plus or minus 5%. So some of those went the other directions. It was the men who got an adjustment. Um, I won't name her because I don't have permission to do it right now, but I, normally I do. But there's a very senior person here at UCSF who was paid $460,000 less than her male counterpart in 1991. We went to the president's office for UC. We were able to go back five years on compensation. She went on years later to be the person who did these studies 10 years, 15 years later. So two points, collect the data, but get the buy-in before the data is there to say what will happen and what actions will be taken in response. Um, I brought this really annoyingly large folder. This is, um, I don't know if it shows on the camera this way, this is only final reports of UCSF gender equity related work that we did on this campus over the 30 years I was here. You have a legacy on which you can build, as they say, stand on the shoulders of others. This is a great place to do this work and get, it, get changes made. Thanks. Can I just add one thing? Um, so just to show you the total support, and I won't say who it is, but uh, someone was hired um, at a hospital for a high level level job. And um, we were all very excited. And the, the pay package was extremely fair considering this individual's past pay package um, at another institution. But then it was brought to our attention that everyone else in the job at all the other UC campuses in the same job, all of whom were men, were getting more money. So it was brought to the regents and we automatically raised the salary so it was equal to the men. This individual, this woman didn't even ask for it, but that's how strongly we feel. So you have full support for equal pay for equal work. And I think, you know, the regions aren't going to be able to go around to each campus and say, oh, you know, this professor's not getting the same or this one. That's up to you to do. And, and um, as the provost just said, you have this incredible database. And if you go to each campus with the data, I think the adjustments will be relatively easy because that's one of our core principles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you, for these inspiring responses. And um, I will say, Regent Lansing, we're going to try to learn how to make documentaries. <laughs> I try. It was very painful to watch my first attempt. Um, but I have a question shifting gears to retention. Uh, and I'll address this to Provost Krogan first, and then I would love to hear also from Regent Lansing. The 2018-19 faculty exit survey from UCSF, which is the, the last one we have data on, shows that women continue to leave UCSF at a rate that is greater compared to their general representation in the, in, across the faculty. And uh, we were wondering um, if you have any thoughts regarding how we could be, first of all, is this the same at UC Davis? And do you have any thoughts regarding how we could be more intentional? And then I'll have a follow-up question related to that. So, we have the data at UC Davis. Uh, women do not leave at a faster rate or higher rate than men, but people of color leave at a slightly 
more rapid rate. Uh, and it has nothing to do with not being tenured or anything along those lines. Quite honestly, it's the same issue, at least when I knew the data for UCSF well, this problem was happening here where they were offered incredibly competitive packages at other institutions. Um, my time here on this campus, Harvard and Hopkins were two of the biggest culprits. And I don't know if that's still the case, but it always felt like we would hire, hire particularly a person of color, mentor them, get their career launched, provide the mentoring and the resources, and then Harvard would steal them away. That was a very common phrase. I'm looking up at Dan, kind of like if that's still happening and he's nodding, no? Okay, and Dan was one of those people, by the way, who got pulled away to Harvard and thankfully came back. Um, but I think that, aspect of why are they leaving in those exit surveys is really, really critical. Uh, it gets complicated here at UCSF in particular by the cost of housing, mm -hmm. all the things you all know, and that's only gotten worse. But the University of California has tried, in fact, incredibly hard, I think, to help faculty with those issues, not just the original MOP loan programs, but there's now four ways to help faculty purchase a home. And uh, some of these are really creative and competitive. So I'm hoping that will help. Uh, what I see at UC Davis very specifically, we're kind of in the tail end of retention season right now. Um, it, it's, it's not the 12 month calendar that you deal with here more. There's more of a season and a cycle for general campus faculty in particular. So by spring, they've decided they're leaving and they've signed an offer letter or you've retained them and they're staying. Um, it oftentimes is infrastructure that's really the, the problem. And something like a $1.5 million mass spec piece of equipment. And am myself, the vice chancellor of research and the dean gonna each pony up half a million dollars to buy that piece of equipment because that's really how it's gonna come down. A third, a third, a third. And uh, there are times when I look at it and I say it's half a million dollars, no matter what, in lost productivity if this person leaves and we have to recruit them. And then we've got a new startup package for the next person and the delay in them getting up to speed. And so if I go from 500,000 to 1.5 million, is that an equivalence? Probably not. But what else do they provide? beyond that? What, where do they stand in the teaching faculty? Where's their research stand? And if they are part of a critical mass, if they are part of an area of priority for the campus, honestly, I'm gonna do my damnedest not to let them go. And just yesterday, there was one of those people where we set up an appointment for the provost to express the love of the provost and the campus. And I actually say that, we love you. We don't want you to leave because if you're that blatant, they can't say you didn't try and uh, make it clear that we, we will do our best to retain you. Very often that can make the difference right there of them knowing you care mm -hmm. and you want them to stay. So quite honestly, those kinds of retentions and recruitments are an issue. I will add the other aspect that I think less from the administrative standpoint, more from the faculty member's standpoint, is them having a cadre, a network of people that they can speak to on these issues. And my first time ever in Cole Hall here was to listen to a group of women who were talking about advancement and promotion at UCSF, including the critical importance of achieving step six professor and what a difference that made on your retirement. So I was 28 years old and I was being told what I had to strive for at the end of my career. Mm -hmm. That group of women I went down to talk to later, Diane Wera was one of them. Again, another who's who of UCSF history. Uh, and they made all the difference in the world in my career here for the next 30 years. So that's the other critical component. There's the formal mentoring, and then there's the informal networks, people who teach you how to negotiate, who tell you a package is not sufficient, who give you a sense of, of equity across. The campus and I think that's really critical. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you so much and you're you're right the uh, the first reason was actually the cost of living 
on the faculty exit survey. Mm -hmm. So um, my follow-up question. Can I just please, add? Please, please, please. Yeah. So yeah. I, I just want to say that um, I agree with everything that was said, but I want to add some context to it. Um, I think every region feels that the faculty and the chancellors um, and the medical CEOs, whatever, are all underpaid. Um, we don't have enough money to be competitive. And that's something that we talk about a lot. And I've always felt um, in Los Angeles, you know, that USC has, because it's private, has a list of all of the people that, that are our best people. And they just want to pluck them off one by one by one by one. So it's not just Harvard. I mean, it's, it's local. And so we, we are unable to offer the salary level that private institutions can. As a matter of fact, we're criticized sometimes for the salary levels that we, we give people, even though I think the criticism is grossly unfair. So what we've tried to do, as Mary said, is to pay you in a different way with housing supplements, which um, you discussed already, um, with um, retirement benefits, and then that were really good. I mean, you know, you really do have a great retirement package, you know, for everybody. And then, you know, we've gotten creative like schools. We have, you know, you know, schools like UCLA has a, you know, um, a pre preschool all the way up uh, through high school, which is an enticement to get faculty because your kids can go to a really good school and you, you don't have to pay uh, like the private individual does. Um, the thing that keeps people here though, even with all of that, like a lot of times I'll know someone was recruited and I'll ask them, you know, why didn't you take that? You know, a lot of people do, but why didn't you? And they'll say, well, because it's so prestigious and the people that I'm dealing with in my research projects are so great. And I will not have that at that other institution. So mm -hmm. I'd rather have less money and have the intellectual stimulation. So that we can offer better than anyone else. Um, and then of course, I, I, I don't know why women are leaving because more than men or people of color are leaving more than men, other than maybe in this climate, they're being picked off more because every, every institution is trying to increase the number of women and increase the number of people of color. But this inequity exists for men too. I mean, we mm -hmm. are not competitive in, in our pay packages. And we're trying to be extremely creative to recruit people and take the heat, so to speak, when, when we get criticized for paying somebody more. Um, and then the only other thing I would add, perhaps women, it's not fair, but we do take on the role of caregiver more than men do. And we really do take on roles outside of our careers, um, though there's a movement for men to, to do it as much now. I see it especially in younger people, but perhaps they have to leave for reasons that have nothing to do with the university. I have mm -hmm. never heard anyone leave because they weren't stimulated um, by yeah. the intellect that they yeah. were having. I, I've, I've heard, well, how could I turn it down? They offered me four times my salary. I know it's not so good, but you know, I'll come back. You know, and and we just keep trying to come up with other ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you, Regent Lansing. Actually, that is a perfect segue mm -hmm. to my follow up question, um, which is actually a great example of asking a question in the women's voice um, is uh, the answer will help everyone, women, men and everyone else. Um, this is a question regarding counter offers. Uh, people in, in this latest exit survey, 55 women left, only four got counter offers, and 49 men left, and three got counter offers. And it is true that some indicated that they would not have been interested in receiving a counter offer. So the question here is this is perhaps unspoken, but in some cases explicitly stated that you have to go to another institution to get an offer and then negotiate a retention package. And we've talked to faculty members who want to be here for exactly those reasons, for the intellectual stimulation, for the great privilege of being at the University of California. And they don't want the, emotion, the emotional cost of going out, getting another offer. Uh, so the question is, how about those who never want to do that? How about those who choose to stay 
and do not want to show that they're more appreciated when they're valued by an external institution. How do we reward loyalty? And maybe we'll start with Provost okay. Logan. And I apologize, I'm, I do have an emergency I'm trying to deal with oh. and they're texting me, so I, I might have to step out for a moment. Um, we know you're loyal. <laughs> <laughs> very loyal, uh, especially UCSF and UC Davis. And I will say both out loud. Um, so on the counter offer, I will honestly say that wasn't so much of an issue in the past here. Um, so kind of tugging at my heartstrings to, to hear that in the exit survey data, women weren't being offered counter offers nearly so often. Um, one of the reasons we got the buy-in and the mentoring task force work because it really meant departments had to put money on the table to participate in that. And I will also add, it wasn't optional, it was a requirement on the campus, the way we structured it. Uh, we did that because the cost of losing people was so high. And mentoring at that time was named as the number one reason that people thought of leaving. They didn't think people cared about them. They didn't have somebody watching out for their career development. They didn't have assistance with you know, uh, career mentoring, advice, grantsmanship, anything along those lines. So those were the impetus for developing it. At um, Davis, I can tell you that is some 10% of my job, probably. I'm looking at Ann Jones, my chief of staff. Counter offers are uh, a pretty constant um, aspect of being a provost, a dean, or a department chair. And when you have a super strong person that you don't want to lose, you put as much as you can possibly afford on the table to keep them there. So I'm not through that implying that anybody doesn't want them, that they want them to leave. I'm just wondering if people knew about the opportunity to counter offer early enough. I find that once a person is already really entertaining mm -hmm. an offer, mm -hmm. you're halfway out the door. You've mm -hmm. got one foot out the door and something has intrigued you enough to do that, that you're much better off being able to do a retention offer and counter before they actually physically go to the place to interview. Because mm -hmm. you're gonna see them in their best light and they're gonna do everything possible to get you there. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, thank you. Regent Lansing, any any thoughts from you? Well, just, you know, this is common in the movie business too. Um, many movie executives will say, I, I had to leave the studio because that's the only way I could be promoted. And what, what is the cause of that? We take people for granted. And that is, I think, one of the biggest dangers of any leader who's heading up a department or a university or a team in any way. The person that's there and smiles every day and seems so happy, we go, oh, they're fine. And we don't nurture them enough. And it's completely up to us. It's completely up to us to give someone a raise before they ask for it. It's completely up to us to give someone a generous bonus before they ask for it, to try and help them with housing or schooling of their, their family. And that's the way you keep people. But what, what often happens, and I'm sure it's the same here, is that shiny new thing that you never knew, that person always looks better than the person that's been there forever. I don't feel that way. I always am afraid of what I don't know, and I'd rather keep the people I do know. But I, I've seen it happen all the time. Oh, so-and-so's great. And, you know, we don't know them. So they seem great because you've had five minutes of a meeting with them. And the people that are tried and true, we tend to take them for granted. And, and I think that um, part of mentoring and part of keeping people is to constantly show them how grateful you are in words, in expressing it emotionally and celebrating their achievements in having dinners or lunches with them so that you keep in contact, contact and say, is there anything bothering you? You know, I never want to lose you. I want you here forever. Is there anything I can do to make sure that you never leave? Is there anything you're missing? And then, you know, don't make them ask for a raise and give it to them. Don't make them ask for a bonus, give it to them. Don't make them worry about their kids. Try and help them get the best schools. And, and then I think um, since we do have this great 
which can't be beat, this great intellectual rigor and this, and this great community of scholars, most people don't want to leave. And they leave simply because they don't feel appreciated or in some cases, and there's nothing we can do about it because they're offered five times their salary. What can we do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. And, and to those of us who are listening or are in Zoom, give us your suggestions about what can be done so you yeah. feel more appreciated. That's why we're having this conversation. Thank you. And I think another part of retention is, is offering opportunities. People want opportunities to continue to advance. And to that end, we see that data at UCSF show that women are less likely to hold distinguished professorships or endowed chairs that can provide financial support, even after you adjust for scholarly performance. So Provost Pro, again, I'll turn to mm -hmm. you first. Do you see this also at UC Davis? What do you think are the tools that we can use to improve equity in these areas? So we've, first of all, I, I know the topic here is gender equity, but we've tried to take a very diverse definition of equity. So whether it's gender, whether it's ethnicity, whether it's uh, physical ability, a variety of things. And if you look across that whole gamut and definitely on a gender, whether it's male, female, non-binary, uh, I've not seen problems on that with the endowed chairs. However, a huge caveat, I would add, you are way ahead of us on endowed chairs. <laughs> so we are um, truly at the beginning. I would say, you know, having a professor uh, endowed or a department chair endowed or an institute director endowed is not as common there as it is here. Uh, but I, but there isn't a discrepancy in that at this point. Nevertheless, uh, there is a desire to have more. It is critical, as you've already said, to collect the data and know that. And we are in fact making an extremely concerted effort around more endowments for ethnic specific related work. So whether it's in any of the ethnic studies departments, whether it's in DEI uh, related research, whether it's looking at underserved, uh, underrepresented uh, minority status populations, vulnerable populations, those are areas where we're trying to put more of the endowments now. And honestly, that will lead to that being more women and more people of color with endowments as a result. So we don't have as many, and our intent is to be very directive in where we try to put those funds going forward. So very intentional about setting up these endowments in areas where you know there's a higher chance that you're going to support women or underrepresented minorities exactly. in positions. Exactly. And Regent Lansing, um, interested in any thoughts from you as well. Um, do you so think there's anything that we should be doing to kind of um, improve equity in this area? Well, I think um, you have to first start with fundraising. You have to raise money to have these endowed chairs and they can be specifically, you can specifically have a fundraising campaign to raise, to, to raise money for endowed chairs for women. You can specifically have an, uh, a fundraising campaign to raise endowed chairs for people of color. And there are a lot of people out there that would want to contribute to that if it was presented to them specifically. And similarly, if you have somebody that you're trying to raise an endowed chair for, you should look at the network of people. I mean, I'm telling you, I think something that, that you probably do already. The network of people that that professor or clinician has touched and try to raise endowed chairs from that. Um, the small amount that I've been involved in that, it's been rather successful when we targeted individuals who we felt had been touched by the teachings or touched by the, obviously a grateful patient is always the easiest to, to raise money from. But I think, I think we all want more endowed chairs. Um, I think that's a great retention wet package also. Um, and I think we just don't have the money. So we have to raise money. And to say we're raising money to increase the endowed chairs for women is very appealing to a lot of philanthropists. Yeah, that's great. Great. And suggestion. obviously people of color is 
also extremely appealing to a lot of right. philanthropists. And, and clearly, while we're focused on gender equity, we're really talking about issues that are broader than just right. gender equity. So right. all of these kind of span, you know, multiple areas. And you might have intersectionality with it as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And back to the quite earlier question on retention, an endowed chair is often part of a requested retention package mm -hmm. as well. Uh, can't usually produce it at the moment, but even the commitment to do so will at least, I, my, my take is maybe 70% of the time keep the person there. I can tell you a, I can tell you a personal story that just shows you, um, we were, um, and it is retention, we were in danger of losing somebody, at one of the hospitals that most of the donors really wanted, actually all of them. And we set up an endowed chair for the job. And that was the way we could increase the salary. So it's another way of increasing salary, but you know it's very it's much easier to do it with grateful patients than it is, but but there are grateful students that say you know I learned everything from this teacher and I want to pay he or she back, and um, there's a great deal of wealth um, out there now, and and a, a great many young people who do want to give, and if you're specifically saying we want to increase the number of endowed chairs for women or for people of color, that's very appealing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We're, we're taking notes on all those great <laughs> ideas, you should know. Um, the, my next question is on invisible work, and I'll define that. That's the work that you don't see. Um, that's not captured through our formal mechanisms. So women are actually well known, perhaps in the film industry and definitely in academia and everywhere else, uh, for doing this kind of work, for example, doing more admin work for your clinical or educational program without any formal role or salary support or WRVU credit. And maybe we'll start with Regent Lansing on this one. Any suggestions on how to make the invisible work visible and how to quantify and reward it? And have you seen this uh, in the film industry, perhaps? So there's many, many cases of it in the film industry. But it's not just for women. It, 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 I have to say in the film industry, it's both women and men. It's an industry that people want to get into very badly. So the entry level jobs are often not even um, you know, minimum wage paying. And there was a, a, lots of articles. And so they, you know, some of the companies had to adjust. But people just want to be there so badly that they're, you know, they'd work for free. They just want the opportunity to get in the door and then prove themselves. So invisible work should be acknowledged. And I guess I would go back to the first question that was asked about how do we take a holistic approach of somebody in the faculty? And shouldn't we include this invisible work in that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And Provost Krogan? I, I think, Sherry, that's an excellent response of, of taking the holistic approach, whether it's service, Mm -hmm. uh, you're both committee chairs, uh, that'll go on your CV and be part of your advancement, but how much credit will you really be given for it? The credit will be based on how much the campus values that service and what difference it makes. <clears throat> I chaired the chancellor's advisory committee on the status of women here when I was an assistant professor. Most people would say somebody shouldn't do that level of service as an assistant professor. I would agree with that now, uh, but that's how we got all that gender equity work started. And, and when we made the initial, the first parental leave policy for the University of California. Mm -hmm. um, so I certainly don't regret it, but it meant I was sort of called to the principal's office about three or four years in. Uh, Diane Wera and Bill Margaretten called me in and said, you're committing professional suicide. You know, you're one of the top teachers on campus. You, uh, I didn't yet have a teaching award like the Senate one, but they're like, you're, you're in charge of the first year curriculum. These are the old medical school curriculum days. And, um, and you're doing all this service, including chairing CACSAW. It, you're, you're gonna get promoted based on research. And unless that becomes the focus that you're spending your time on, you're not gonna make it. And I said, but I'm at an academic institution because those other things are the things I want to do. So 
I really wanted to just focus on research, I'd work at Genentech and make three times the money, especially as an epidemiologist where you can design clinical trials and things like that. So they said, look, you gotta do research. Well, I said, what's the point of the realm? They said, you have to have an R01 to come up for associate. I said, fine. I had an R01 three months later. I had another one three months after that. For the next 25 years, I brought in R01s, never resubmitted. I still kept that level of service and for 15 years kept that level of teaching up because that's what I loved. Mm -hmm. That's why I wanted to be here. And so to me, that was invisible service, which at the time wasn't getting rewarded. By the way, I was also a single mom with four kids. That did make me start cutting back on a lot of that service. I just couldn't do it all. Uh, but part of that service was making sure people got rewarded for that work. Mm -hmm. And that's when we changed the APM. So it wasn't just teaching, it was teaching and mentoring. Wow. Particularly people of color and women tend to do much more mentoring. If you didn't get credit for it in your advancement package, then it was invisible service, for example. Wow. So those are the kinds of things that I would say I, I, could, I could not have stopped myself. I would not have enjoyed my work if I didn't do that. And yet part of that service became making sure people got credit for it. It was rewarded. We started most of the awards programs that you can see out in the lobby when you come in. Uh -huh. That was trying to give recognition to that invisible service too. Provost Krogan, thank you so much. So many faculty members, thank you for that teaching and mentoring. It is, <laughs> I can tell you the page in the APM <laughs> where that is. I think it's page 27. Well, and now everybody's checking. Is Todd knows, but yeah, that was, that was one of my initiatives. Wow, thank you so much. So uh, to the people in the audience also, give us your suggestions on how we can quantify. We're not done with this discussion. We just started in that we understand, we acknowledge that it should be made visible, but we don't yet do that. Um, should it be a rubric? Should it be a candidate statement? Please let us know your thoughts. Um, and then I want to be respectful of the audience questions. I think we have time for one more question and then we go to poll everywhere. Okay, so um, we left this for the last one. This is on microaggressions. Um, and maybe I'll start with Regent Lansing on this one. I'm sure you'll have a lot to say. And then Provost Krogan, microaggressions are normalized, meaning after we've experienced so many of them. And this goes once again for, for underrepresented minority faculty, not just, not just women, for, for so many of us. Um, but after experiencing many of them, people just shrug them off and then move on. This is a lost opportunity for offering feedback, um, of course, they're not reported or perhaps they're reported minimally. Um, and this is also uh, perhaps something that leads to lack of psychological safety and feeling like not belonging. So starting with the film industry, are there insights that you can share with us, Regent Lansing, on how the university can leverage any lessons learned to address this issue? Well, the film industry was rife with microaggressions and it's been um, well documented in the press in the last, I guess, five, seven years, you know, with the Harvey Weinsteins of life. Um, and, and, you know, he's actually in jail. So um, the film industry had a long history of uh, huge aggressions and small aggressions and lack of sensitivity, whatever. And then a, a group of women, you know, as I said, you know, said enough is enough. And they started speaking up. When I was coming up in the film industry, if I had spoke up, there was no HR, I would have been fired. It's really that simple. I would have been perceived as a troublemaker. Today, if I speak up about a small aggression, it's taken extremely seriously and investigated. And so it's gone from, the extreme of nothing to the extreme of, again, I respect everybody, but you know, he put his arm on my shoulder and I was uncomfortable and I respect if someone was uncomfortable, but that is investigated in the film industry or, you know, told a bad joke. I mean, everything is investigated. And I think the University of California has the same culture. You know, we, we you know, have great papers and rules about sexual harassment, about microaggressions, whatever. And I think it is the duty 
for every single person who suffers something to speak up about it. Now, there are many ways you can speak up about it. it. Depending on the aggression, you can literally go to the person and simply say, I'm uncomfortable. And if the person responds and says, I'm so sorry, I'll never do that again. And you feel satisfied with that, that's okay. But if it's something that you feel, you know, is, is, is uh, much greater than that or something you can't handle yourself, go to HR. HR will take it really seriously. Um, and, and we've seen that in the university re recently with some cases that have been made public that were beyond micro, I mean, they were horrible aggressions and how seriously we take it. So I think it's up to the person who is, quote, the victim to not be afraid to speak out and to go to HR, which is quite different than when I was growing up. But I know if I was today in the film business, I would have a supportive HR and I know they would take me seriously. And I know I would not be fired or, you know, uh, looked down on for bringing it up. I would be respected. And so I think that I think the world has changed. I really do. Um, and I think that any aggressions are taken very seriously by all companies and all universities. And I guess I just end with this you know comment we can't stop bad behavior i mean people are going to act the way they're going to act but i can guarantee you that in every institution that i'm part of it won't happen a second time because if the person goes to hr the person who he or she who co committed the aggression will be dealt with from you know, going to sensitivity training, taking courses to all the way to what I just said is jail, you know? So um, I think it's our moral obligation to speak up, not just for ourselves, but for the safety of everybody else. Thank you. I, I think it's a little more challenging in an academic environment, mm. quite honestly. Um, I wish I didn't have to say that, but there's a difference between faculty and staff, first of all. So we have HR for staff and we have other mechanisms around faculty. A tenured faculty member has really got to do something fairly egregious to have tenure revoked and be fired, quite honestly. Uh, not that we won't do it, not that we don't do it, but uh, it's going to be a process that they should be afforded to get to the point where that happens. So an important aspect of that is not uh, disadvantaging the person who reported. Oftentimes we do that, we'll move that person to another area so they're not near the, near the aggressor or whomever the person is that had the violation. I personally think it's important to support the person who's been considered the victim in a situation and move out the aggressor and, and honestly have them be a little more disadvantaged in the process. I also think that when any of us witness it, it is 100% our responsibility to stand up and say something in the moment, in real time, support the person who's being victimized and not allow it to continue. I think that's the single most important thing to do. It could happen behind closed doors. It could happen one-on-one. -on -one, and then obviously that's not possible. And I agree, if it's a staff member, someone who has HR support to do that, if not as a faculty member going to your division chief or your department chair to report, they are then a mandated reporter if it's sexual harassment. But I consider people to be mandatory reporters, even if it's bullying or microaggressions. But can we I see these things happen. Can I happen. Uh, uh, provost? So again, I I think as the entire time I was a regent with two tenured professors, um, I believe, I, I won't go into it, that 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 were because of microaggressions lost their tenure. I think it was two in the entire time. So I know how serious this is and how difficult it is, but it is in, in the faculty's hands. I mean, in the sense that when these things are reported through HR to the faculty, the faculty can create a culture. I know it's tough because you know, you know, you you want due process. You want to make sure what the aggression is. But but I think there has to be a culture where people know that 
that this is not to be tolerated. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for this great discussion. And we have a few more questions from the audience. Uh, Christy is going to help us uh, prioritize. Hello, I'm Christy Tappan, and I work for the Academic Senate. And it is my pleasure to be picking out some of your audience questions. I'm sorry we're not going to get to them all. So I'm going to take some of the top questions, and then I'm going to cherry pick a few. And so to start it off, Regent Lansing, you were talking about the importance of nurturing people and recognizing people and just making sure people know their value. And that made me think about who is really good at that in my life? And the answer is women. And that made me think how great it would be if there were more women in leadership roles where they would be able to do this nurturing and support. And so the most voted for question we have is asking about how we can improve gender equity among leadership. And the question is how can we give more women more time and compensation to do this work to become leaders? And so your thoughts on how we can enable women to take on those leadership roles. I, I agree with you. We, we are, I, I hate to say, cause there's some, I had some great male mentors. So I, I don't want to single it out, but women are historically more nurturing, you know, just our friendships are more important, you know, maybe the way we raise children, whatever. And I think um, you just have to be conscious of saying, again, I go back to this holistic view of faculty, that mentoring can be something that you, you view as something that, that increases your ability to get promoted. Do you know, that, that's something that, that we all should do. We all should feel that we're mentoring. And, and I think, you know, we do a lot in the film business with established people and people coming into the business. We have a lot of lunches together, you know, that you're invited, you know, have lunch with, with you know, this faculty member who's won the Nobel Prize and you're, you know, starting your career or have, have joined this women's group that, you know, um, as you enter your position and meet people who are more established, we have a lot of that. And women leaders share with upcoming or new people leadership skills, and they're there to talk to them. They're there to make calls to help them. I, I think it really starts kind of in a structured social manner that you interact with each other. And as you interact with each other, you are mentoring somebody and they're growing. But I think it has to be done in in more social situations. And again, I go back to holistic. If you're responsible for, you know, five people being the leaders in their field, that's that's something that should be considered. I don't know if I really answered the question, but I hope I did. Yeah, I think you did. And I think one of the things we were specifically interested in is making sure that you know everyone, but women in particular, are given the time that they need to become leaders and are compensated so that they can become leaders. I think it's related to the invisible work, but it's also like, how can we think about making time and financial support available so that more women can move up? Well, there's a big movement um, in every business right now. It's a perfect time to do it, to have more women and people of color in leadership positions. And you're actually judged by that. You know, in the film business, as I said, there's, you know, we're going to have 50% uh, women and people of color minimum. You know, there's, there's all sorts of quotas that have been established for companies. So I think if the university says, you know, our goal is to have, again, the baseline, this extraordinarily competent person, but we're looking, you know, for a woman or we're looking for a person of color. Yeah. Well, Provost Cron, I'd love your in you know input on this as well and knowing in academics that you know time spent on mentorship is not time than right. doing other things right research to get ro1s or seeing patients and getting rvus so how do we balance that in you know an academic environment i i think it is hugely challenging and i think also for women in particular if they've got child care or elder care responsibilities the kind of networking attendance at national, international conferences, things that get you recognized as a leader in your field, known nationally and internationally, that would lead to something like being a department chair, that's going to be a challenge, a huge challenge. 
So I think it's really critical that people in departments, particularly current department chairs, support women having those opportunities. That's one. Another is that women have got to be members of the academic senate. And I don't say that purely as an ex-academic senate chair, but I can tell you that was a, a very defining moment in my own career here at UCSF. I was hired in the professional research series, got a teaching award. You can't teach in the professional research series. So they recommended my department chair move me to adjunct, which I did, that I had two balanced portfolio by the time I came up for associate with those R01s. So then I was moved into in residence in the academic senate. Only by being a senate member could I be vice chair of my department, could I be a member of CAP, which put me on UCAP, which made me senate chair for the system, which led to me becoming a provost. There is no way that my career would have gone the direct trajectory it did if I hadn't been moved in to an academic senate role. So if you look at academic senate membership by gender equity at UCSF, you will see some issues because we have such a huge amount of clinic. We, you, have the, it's too much of a habit we'll here. Take you. We'll take um, you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but there is such a predominance of the clinical faculty being female now at this point. That's a good thing, I will say, but they're not clinical ex faculty and members of the academic senate. Mm -hmm. So by default, some of that service work does not lead to their advancement and promotion, mm -hmm. which prevents them from obtaining some of the leadership roles. So I, even, oh, go ahead, go, Andrea. I, I was going to make a very quick point. You make it sound effortless. You, you know, you're <laughs> the provost now. So much invisible work must have been there. So what, what our question really is, is how we're going to be able to capture that moving forward. And we've got to have a better way uh, because not everybody yeah. is, you know, incredibly driven, incredibly Whoops. determined and, and productive academically and is able to do all those things. So again, <laughs> sorry to harp on, on old things we did, but like the teaching and mentoring that was trying to bring forward invisible work to make sure people got credit mm -hmm. for it. I'll call mm -hmm. it that. Um, Joe Guglielmo was chair of CAP when I was on CAP. We, and later went on to be the dean of the School of Pharmacy. Um, there is a theme here, as you can see, people doing this service work can lead to leadership roles. But uh, Joe and I, in a, a task force that Joe put together, created a task force on multidisciplinary research. How to give credit for people doing what would now be called transdisciplinary research what uh, credit could be given to people working on research problems of underserved populations or working on issues that affected DEI. And effectively in this cap, on this campus, you get extra credit for that work. So if you come forward and you are doing more challenging research because you're working with vulnerable populations or those who don't trust academicians or researchers, you are getting more credit. I'm sure that still holds in the blue book here in CAP. I'm looking at Todd. And um, Steve. And Steve, yeah. yeah, that's how you can reward that invisible work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So you, you've got to think about what is it that's not being rewarded and get creative in a way to reward it. Mm -hmm. Thank well, you so much. And also going back to one of your comments, it's even being very intentionally when we're hiring people and thinking about what series we're hiring them into because that actually does set their right. opportunities for advancement and leadership positions in the future. Yes. Yeah. Christy, do you want to? I do because this is my favorite question <laughs> that was added uh, by an audience member. It says, who has time to become an activist while also maintaining one's career at UCSF? So I know that's a rhetorical question, but the question I have for the two of you is how can we think about activism in small ways? Like what are ways that any faculty member, no matter how busy, can be involved and do something to advance these causes? Do you want Regent Lansing? Regent Lansing, oh, do you want to sure. take that one first? No, so I'll take it a shot at it. It's gonna sound naive. I mean, just by engaging with other women, you know, I mean, I, I know that sounds, and it sort of goes, how do you get more women leaders? If you're a leader, 
in your field, um, you know, you can become very isolated and, and it's not healthy to just, you know, uh, it doesn't provide for a healthy lifestyle to just, you know, every day go to your office, not talk to anybody, do your research, you know, maybe spend time with a you know, little time with your students or in your classes, but, but really not engage with other women who are people that are sharing a lot of the same problems that you are, even if they're not at the same level. So I think one of the ways that, that you can help advance women is to embrace other women and to spend time with them in a relaxing way. You know, um, the film industry has unbelievable amount of women in film, women in entertainment, women in television, women in this, women in that. And they always are getting together and they're sharing war stories and they're sharing their frustrations. And, and then they're engaging with women at different levels than they are and they're learning from them. So I think, I know it sounds simplistic, but if you have a very, very busy life, just engaging in friendships with other women will help other women you know, advance. And obviously the more women you hire, the more women leaders there's going to be because the bigger the pool is, the bigger chance for advancement. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you have a choice and all things are equal, you know, mm -hmm. um, you can choose the woman just because you feel I'd like to, like to help that cause, assuming all things are equal or the person of color or whatever you want. You don't have to, but you can make that decision. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If, I, if I may just add to whoever asked the question and everybody else, you're here, you're a woman faculty at UCSF. You are an activist, you are a leader. You've gone through two years of pandemic working incredibly hard. You're here now and you're listening to us. You don't need to do more than you're, what you're doing already, uh, but email us afterwards yeah. if you have thoughts for us. Well, and then I would also say there are amazing activist groups that have already been created at UCSF. There's the UCSF Women Physician Scientist Supergroup that you can be a part of, who's advocating, who we spoke to and making our questions to understand what issues they're dealing with and what issues they care about. There's, I see Lucy here from the Muriel Steele Society who is trying to you know, advocate for women in surgery. I mean, there's plenty of examples of groups at UCSF who are using, and, and the Senate, right? I mean, here we are as part of the Senate trying to be activists as well. So there are ways to be an activist. But I agree with you that if, you, if that's too much, that you can just be a part of the community and know that there are a group of women that are supporting you. Mm -hmm. question? Yes, uh, the next question with the second highest number of votes was how do we develop a culture of sponsoring female and upper underrepresented colleagues? So your tips for developing a culture of sponsorship. Provost Krogan, you wanna start with that? Sure, I think you need to be very intentional to use your, your terminology. Um, I, I've probably had 200, 300 mentors across my lifespan starting at about the age of 12 and I feel 100% committed to paying that forward. So the mentoring clearly, but the sponsorship, recognizing people who should be put forward for committees, who should be nominated for awards. Uh, committee service, it, to me, is generally a form of activism. It doesn't always feel that way. Uh, it might feel administrative at times, but to me, that's the networking, that's the opportunity to get to know other people on the campus, to be involved and make a difference. Um, and sponsorship of other members of the faculty to serve on those committees can be one of the most critical things you can do and do it with your professional committees. You know, nominate people to serve on a review committee for NIH or studies section. Even if it's an ad hoc one, it gets them known by uh, program officers and can move them in. And one of the best things you can ever do to get better at grant writing is to look at other people's grants and learn from the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. So all those things of sponsorship, I think, can really make a difference in someone's career. Mm -hmm. Regent Lansing, did you have any? Well, to I, ask? I just think that any, you know, when I'm, I'm, I'm struck by the activist question. I mean, in a funny way, because this kind of ties <laughs> into it. So we all are involved in a lot of things. 
and you know, we're involved in a lot of meetings. Uh, you know, we're on a lot of committees. We're on, you know, you know, a lot of causes that we care about. But as you're involved in those things, um, if you get more women involved, um, you're changing the culture. You know, if you reach out to women that you know and say, look, I think you would enjoy being on this committee. You know, uh, I think you'd enjoy being on, on, on the academic center. And, I, and you start to talk to women about it. If you, if you start to reach out to them already on the things that you're doing and you support them and you hire them, you're mentoring them just by reaching out. And when you hear there's an opportunity or a job opening, if you advocate them for that position. So I think it's kind of something, I don't know how to do it. It's invisible, that word that you use, or it's subconscious. If you really are fully committed to having more women in the workplace, then whatever you're doing, you'll naturally be reaching out to women to join you in whatever committees you're on. You'll naturally be mentoring them just by seeing them and you'll be supporting them. And if you hire more women, as I said, and get them involved in more committees, then you'll have more leadership of women. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I may add, thank you so much for those wonderful responses. If I may add, it is the time of the, the season for annual meetings with the vice chair or the division chief and the chair. So one simple suggestion would be to ask when you meet with your faculty, what can I do for you to advance your career in this next year? It's a simple question. I would put it number one on top of your uh, sheet, worksheet, or however you're, you're talking to your faculty members. Just ask first, what can I do for you? Excellent advice. I, it's wonderful. We have a few questions um, that are also kind of a comment that, that maybe you could all comment on. A few uh, faculty members and audience members pointed out um, how difficult these issues are for women of color in particular, and noting that there have been a lot of uh, a perception of a lot of black women leaving UCSF. And so it's not so much a question, but just a noting the intersectionality that you pointed out. And so I, I would invite both of you just to comment on the unique challenges that women of color um, face in this environment. Provost Krogan, do okay. you want to take that Thank first? Thank you. Um, if, if I might, I, I know your question was Black women, but I will add to that uh, any other aspects of difference. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. beyond the kind of standards, so someone who's non-binary, someone who's transgender, anytime you take one to two to three to five to 10, uh, I think it just complicates it, it much, much further. So to me, having a trusted person who can sit down and do a real heart to heart, I mean, technically you could call it a, an exit survey, but finding out what worked and what didn't work, what could we have done to support you? And importantly, what could we do now that would still keep you here? Don't assume that they're leaving for sure and see if there's something you can do to, to intervene in real time and, and change it for them. Um, those kinds of conversations oftentimes are where you find out that there is a bully or a microaggressor or sexual harassment or something going on in the department that can be changed ideally for that person but even if that's not possible, it needs to be changed for everyone else. It's rarely that person who was the only person experiencing the issues, but they may be, for lack of a better term, kind of the canary in the, in the coal mine where they've unfortunately experienced the worst of it. And now you better fix it for them and for everyone else. Um, I think it's one of the hardest things we do is trying to ensure that people feel welcomed, that they see people who look like them across the table at every place they go, every meeting, every event, and that they feel included and part of the community. And that's important for all of us to achieve. I think some of it goes back to one of Andrea's questions about, you know, how do we reward loyalty? Mm -hmm. And it, it's in the same vein of, you know, how do we get away from having to do exit surveys with people and instead, how do we do, how do we maintain retention without having the threat of exit? How do we make sure that people are in a safe 
protected, supportive environment by, you know, how do we create that culture that that's the norm, that they're able to raise issues as they come up so that they don't get to the point of wanting right. to leave? Well, and in Sam's introduction of me, he named three departments that I belonged to when I was here. So I had three completely different cultures across those three departments, uh, which was always an enigma to me. Uh, but my primary appointment, my first 15 years here was in family and community medicine. So this is where directly to your point of culture, I was pregnant with my fourth child, uh, 12 weeks along for women who get, who got sick in their pregnancies. I was desperately ill 24 hours a day in that pregnancy for seven months. But most importantly, I was on a plane that almost crashed the night before at a national conference in family medicine. So my department chair walked in the next day and he said, I heard about the, the near miss accident yesterday. I'm surprised you came in. Okay, number one, would have been okay for me to take the day off. Number two, I understand you're pretty shaken up and pale and you really don't look good. Um, is everything okay? And I, and I, Jack Rodnick was his name, wonderful person. And I said, part of the complicating factor here is that I'm 12 weeks pregnant and I'm just sick with the pregnancy on top of what I went through yesterday. And he closed the door behind me and he said, you are on track. You are doing just fine in your career. I want you to take the rest of the day off and please, Mary, would you start leaving here at 6 p.m. in the evening and go home and have dinner with your family at night? With this fourth child, I don't want you to keep up the level of devotion and time that you've put in here. Would you do that for me? And if I see you here past six, I'm going to say something to you and suggest you get home. That is a supportive department. That is a department chair was looking at me saying, you need to, you have other aspects of your life that you need to be taking care of too. That's so, where that oh, sorry. comes about. That's a wonderful story. And I think, I think in many ways it sums up what, both of us have been saying, and all of you um, and our wonderful moderators have been saying as well, you know, we're, we're talking about gender equality, but really we're talking about equality. Do you know, I mean, it's, it, it, though we're talking about women, we're talking about anybody who's in a minority group, you know, so we're talking, you know, about, as, as I think Mary said, anybody who doesn't feel welcome. And one of the goals of the university is everyone should feel welcome. So, I, I think that what you just used as an example is what we've been saying. Whoever is the head of the department must look out at everybody who's there in their department or, or the different levels and find out how they are and do they feel welcome. And if you're having people of color leave, you have to find out why. Why are they leaving? Are they leaving because they don't feel welcome? Are they leaving because they got triple the salary? Are they leaving uh, because they had a microaggression? Whatever it is, we have to stop it before they leave. And I think it's true for everybody, to be honest with you. Um, you know, um, I know this is about gender equality, inequality and the attempt to have gender equality, but it's just about equality. So to me, um, a good leader is always somebody who, just as, as, as Mary told the story, who cares about the person and mm -hmm. isn't just looking at them at, 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 as, you know, in, an invisible person, but really cares. And I, I think that's, that will be the way we'll develop more women leaders. That will be the way people won't leave. And that will be the way we eventually will have equality for, for everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. And on, on that, can I summarize? Because these are amazing, amazing insights. We're learning so much from, from both of you and from the questions from the audience. I think what we're saying is that we want proactive leadership that looks at yeah. you, sees you, and hears yeah. you. And, and that's exactly why we're having this round table, because we want the faculty to feel seen and heard. And we will definitely follow up with action items after this. 
I think we have time for one more question. Sure, and um, this, is, this is a little more of a technical question. So if any audience members need to help us, please let us know. <laughs> uh, but it's been upvoted a few times and people have asked when there is suspected gender inequity in a department, what is the best path for a faculty member to address this in a confidential, safe and effective manner? So what are the best reporting options? Well, there, what is, I know the office title has changed is what I'm worried about, but there used to be a, a the ombuds. Yeah, I you've got the ombuds, the ombuds but that's not a mandatory reporting. Uh, in fact, an ombuds person is specifically not supposed to report it. Keep your information confidential. And if you really have an equity issue, there, Diane Ware's old job, what is that now? Yeah, I yeah I would say Brian Aldridge or Renee Navarro. I would go directly to one of the two of them or someone on their team mm -hmm. to work on it. In the, um, but I would first go to the department chair mm -hmm. and and hopefully it can be solved at that level. But if, if the department chair is involved, I'm right. So just to, I'm going to repeat what you said so that the uh, the um, virtual participants can hear. So, you know, first taking it to the department chair to try to, um, you know, express what the issue is with the inequity. And if you feel that it doesn't come to a good resolution, going to academic affairs um, would be the next step to try to get it addressed. Mm -hmm. But a really important question, of course, as we're talking about all of this and wanting to promote equity, we should know, you know, the reporting mechanisms go. and what to actually mm -hmm. do if you notice inequity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the ODO specifically, in Dr. Navarro's office, there is an office for prevention of harassment and discrimination. I think OPHD, and that's another avenue. But of course, as Chancellor Hogwood is saying, maybe starting with the local leadership. Thank you. All right. Go ahead. Oh, we have many, but if we want to stick with our 445 stop, then. Okay. Steve, shall we turn it back to you? Or can we take one, one more question? Go ahead, one more question. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, Regent Lansing in particular, several people are curious about salaries and why can't we get the state of California to increase the base pay for faculty? I agree 100%. <laughs> <laughs> no. we, I've been trying for 22 years to do that. We've lobbied the governor, we we marched, we've found it's very effective when we do it with the students and and the faculty and uh, the chancellors when we, you know, we have a advocacy day. Um, uh, and it's not just us, you know, it's, it's uh, Cal State and, and the community colleges as well. Um, there's a disconnect between how much money we need and how much the legislature and the governor think we need. But I will say on the record that this budget was among the best we ever got. Oh, yeah. So I thank the governor for that. I want to be very clear that um, it was among the best we've ever gotten. Still not good enough, but among the best. <laughs> Can I, if I could add, I completely agree and uh, greatly appreciative of uh, Sherry's hard work. And so others know I had the pleasure of working with Sherry. So when I was vice chair and chair of the academic Senate, you serve on the board of regents and Sherry was there in her leadership role. Um, so we do have a 4% faculty salary scale increase that will begin October 1, and an additional 1.5% that's been awarded for us to do uh, salary equity right. adjustments. Right. And so that is a huge improvement, and that follows on last year's 3%. It has been quite a long time since we've gotten two back-to-back. Very commonly, when we got them in the past, they were more than 2%, so this is doing better. And importantly, the regents have actually been incredibly supportive every time the Academic Senate has come forward with a new salary scale program. One of those was done the year I was vice chair of the Senate. The regents approved it, and they accelerated the staff salary equity program as well. And then 2008-9 hit, we did the first year of implementation and then the recession killed both for the years going forward. So it was supposed to be the faculty over five years and the staff over seven years. The staff got two and a half years or three 
Sherry, correct me if my memory is wrong, and the, the faculty got one year and then nothing more was done because instead we were faced with budget cuts. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's not that we haven't tried. She's absolutely right. That isn't just read general speak. Um, no, we go every year. And yes. then the group of us that um, are on, on, on committees where we target, you know, tar I don't want to say target, where we call specific legislature uh, members of, uh, um, of the state legislature and tell them our story. And we go meet with them and we host events with them and we host Zooms with them. So it's very, very, very much on our top of mind. And I'd say every region is advocating for more money um, for, for, for fairer salaries, more sal more money for salaries and just more money in general so that, yeah. you know, we can hire, you know, the best people and, uh, recruit the best students, but it's a constant thing. And so again, I'll just end because I do want to be very grateful to the governor, uh, the last two years, who's been terrific. And this particular budget was so much better, not everything we wanted. I want to be clear, but, but so much better than it has been in the past. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Thank you so much. We, we want to thank our panelists. This was a fantastic discussion. And to the audience, thank you so much. Uh, follow up next year, perhaps, and we'll tell you how we're doing. Thank you. Well, thank you. You were great moderators. And um, it was just such a pleasure to be part of this. And Pro Provost, it's such a great honor to see you again, Mary, and the two moderators and Sam. It's just a pleasure. And um, I'm always available to help. That's all I can say. So thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'd like to add my personal thanks again to Regent Emerita, Lansing, uh, Provost Krogan, and Chancellor Hoggard. Uh, the, the Senate will curate the pearls, uh, for, and there are many from this uh, roundtable, and work with the Chancellor's Office uh, to advance uh, equity at UCSF and beyond. Uh, the meeting is now closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.